You know, before we get started, what a great thing this afternoon to have fishers of men out there and just letting people know about our church. It's a great thing. You know, part of, um, I was just reading this afternoon and um, there, was, uh, there was a great book out there called Revitalize by a man named Andrew Davis and I've kind of followed him for a number of years now and he, um, he said there's really two journeys that the that everybody in the church has to go on. One is an inward journey of spiritual maturity to become more like Jesus. And the other journey is an, is an outward journey. Because Jesus called, to be, called us to be you know, making disciples of all people. And so it's not just about what happens in our hearts though, that's really of significance, but, but it's also that part where we go out and we share the good news, where we where we share uh, the love that God has given to us. And so uh, I'm excited that, that that step has been taken and thanks to all of you who went out and, and did that. In, um, in May of 1983, I know that seems like ages ago, it feels like ages ago too, uh, but in May of that year, uh, I graduated from uh, Talbot Theological Seminary with my Master's of Divinity degree. Um, it, Nancy at that moment in time was about um, about two months into uh, her first pregnancy. And uh, our first child, Daniel, would eventually uh, be born. And uh, she was about to stop teaching. Uh, at the end of that school year in June, she was gonna stop in order that she could uh, you know, stay home and, and uh, be with our baby. So that meant that I was gonna have to find some kind of work. And so the, the previous two summers while I was in grad school, I, I uh, I picked up a part-time job working as a, as a chemist for a, a printing ink manufacturing company. It happened to be a, a place in La Mirada, in fact, uh, that made printing ink for different kinds of uh, you know, end-use printing kinds of jobs. And uh, what was interesting was that this uh, company that I was working for for those two summers was actually uh, a branch of the company that I'd worked for when we lived in Minneapolis for the three years prior to that. And, uh, and so I was able to walk in, do the same job I'd done for several years. I mean, it was one of those God things, right? I mean, I never even thought about this, but, uh, you know, God let me get into a school and it just happened that that school was in La Mirada and just so happens that a branch of the company that I'd been working for for several years was in La Mirada too. And, you know, so, I mean, it's got his fingerprints all over it, doesn't it? And so... Um, so for the previous two summers, I'd picked up that job. So of course, when uh, I graduated, I thought, well, I'm gonna go back and see if they'll, uh, if they'll hire me again, and they did. And uh, I was really uh, kind of in a limbo time. I was waiting for um, a ministry position to open up. The church that we were going to had, uh, had designs on creating a staff position for me um, in the near future. And so we were just kind of waiting for that to happen. Didn't know how long that would take. And so um, Nancy quit her job in June. I, I picked up that part-time job again. Uh, the summer became the fall, uh, and the fall began to move into winter. In the, and in the first week of December of that year, um, I was very unexpectedly called into my boss's office. And he said, Sid, I hate to tell you this. He said, but the branch isn't doing as well as we thought it would do. And so we're going to have to lay you off. And I thought, oh. Merry Christmas to you, too. Uh, because the reality was it was a, a pretty big blow to us. I mean, uh, just if you talked financially, uh, we were okay when Nancy was teaching. Um, Christian school teachers, by the way, are very underpaid. <laughs> um, so we were okay when she was working, um, just on the margin uh, when she quit and uh, I was doing this part-time job. And so all of a sudden, December hits, and we find out that I no longer have a job. She's now in the last couple of weeks of her pregnancy. Daniel was going to be born on December 24th. Uh, and, uh, and so here we were staring down the face of the fact that uh, we had absolutely no source of income whatsoever. So like anybody would do in that situation uh, who believes in God, <laughs> uh, the one thing we did was we started to pray. And of course, we let our church family know what was happening to us and asked them to, to pray for us and to pray with us in the midst of this you know, uh, unexpected uh, kind of turn of events. And um, interestingly enough, that within about less than a week's time, uh, there was a rather new attender to our church who uh, cornered me uh, after church uh, the next Sunday. And he said, um, 
short version of the story, he offered me a part-time job uh, doing bookkeeping for his construction company. And so um, I took a bump on that offer, and obviously uh, Nancy and I were grateful. We were elated. We were, you know, praising God for his provision for us, you know, in this uh, 11th hour before Daniel was born. Of course, once I got into the job, I, I, I realized very quickly that, you know what, he really didn't have to hire me. He, uh, he had been doing his own books in the little bits of time, scraps of time that he had here and there, and uh, it, it was working out just fine. Uh, maybe it was easier to a little bit to have somebody else do them, you know, whatever. But the reality was he didn't have to do that. Uh, you know why he did it, though? It's because he felt compassion. And, and, and so he was, he was willing to sacrifice some of his own income in order to meet uh, our needs. Well, the reality is he could have used that money it was a small little construction company and, you know, every dime counts and, and uh, it was almost Christmas. He could have saved that money, had a great Christmas, made a better Christmas for his family, you know, taken his employees out to, I don't know, Christmas dinner, whatever he needed to do. He could have used that money in a thousand other ways. Uh, but out of the kindness of his heart and God's provision, he said, I want to give this to you in that way. And so he, he used those resources that God had given to him to meet the needs of a, a brother and a sister. And I don't know what your dictionary looks like, but in my dictionary, that looks a lot like love. I think that's really what love is about. It's about using our resources in order to meet the needs of someone else. Even making a sacrifice, if necessary, in order that you can actually do something that's in the best interest of somebody else. Well, a few months later, to end the story, a few months later, the church ministry position opened up, and I said, thank you so much, and, and uh, he blessed us on our way as we went on. The rest is kind of now history. But I was thinking about it, and I thought, you know, this man's simple act of sacrifice was, was really an enormous demonstration of love. It's the kind of love that God commands all of us to be engaged in. And if you were with us uh, last Saturday evening, you know that I reminded us about the, the great commandment that God has given us. The great commandment is that we're supposed to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. So, so we, the way we say here at Rice Church is we love God and we love others. That's, that's really the whole bent of what we're trying to do. Uh, we're focused on that. We're just moving steadily, progressively through time towards uh, building us all up in those two kinds of love, loving God and loving others. And, and I to told you that, that you know, for the first couple of quarters this year, we've, we've been focusing on loving God. Now we're going to be talking about loving others. And, and, and I talked last week and spent more, most of the time talking about the fact that we actually have two kinds of neighbors. One, one, one type of neighbor is Christian neighbors, uh, people who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the other type of neighbor are non-Christian neighbors, uh, people who have yet to come to know Jesus Christ. And the, and the scripture makes it very clear to us that, that we are supposed to love everyone. We're supposed to love both of those kinds of neighbors. But we looked at Galatians 6 last week and saw that, uh, that when Paul was writing to the Galatians, what he said to them is that there, there is a priority. That, that he said, especially, you should love everyone, but you should especially love those who are part of the household of faith. In other words, we have a, a God-given priority to love the people who are sitting in this room right now. That's a priority. Doesn't mean we ignore everybody else, uh, but this is our family. And, and uh, you know, God talks in other places, you know, if you don't take care of your family, you know, that's horrible. And so the reality is we have that kind of priority given to us. We, may, we talked about that, that especially we're supposed to love each other. And to, to expand on that definition, it means that we are to particularly and exceptionally love one another. Those of us who are here in this part of the family of faith. Well, obviously, that, that falls really well in line with what Jesus said. In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said this. He says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's a very powerful statement. Uh, because essentially what it, what it tells us is that people will be able to tell whether you and I follow Jesus 
based on how we love each other. It's not about the doctrine that we hold. It's not about, you know, the, any kind of other character quality you want to talk about. It's about whether we love one another. And so this watching world looks at us and they'll be able to tell the authenticity of our faith in Christ based on whether we love one another, especially the family of the faith, or not. And they'll be the judge and the jury on that, I'm afraid. And so you think about it, the testimony of the way that we love each other then, like the story that I began this evening with, uh, is really impactful because not only did, does it meet the needs of the people who are you know, right here sitting in this room, Paul talked about this in his writings, he said, but, but also it, it results in thanksgiving being made, you know, given to God, which it certainly was. And, and even more than that, the kind of love that we have when we're showing this kind of dynamic love for one another becomes a testimony to a watching world. These people are real. This is authentic. There's no other way to explain what these folks are doing for one another other than the fact that somehow God has changed their lives. That's powerful. And so the reality is that, that love is not just some kind of warm feeling, though that's nice. Uh, but, but love actually is work. Uh, we, we talked about this last week. Love costs. Real love means that we're willing to, to use our resources for one another. Real love means that we're willing to sacrifice some of our resources for one another. Now that starts to hurt a little bit. But that's really what love is all about. And the question we might ask is, well, what kind of resources are we talking about? You know, what, is, what are the requirements? What, what, is it, what does it look like to love in the way that Jesus loved? Well, that's what I want to do tonight. I want to show you a couple of places in the scriptures. I want to, to look at the life of Jesus. I want to look at the early church. And, uh, you know, and I want to look a little bit at the writings of Paul to help us understand what, what are we talking about here? If we're really practical, because love is this nice ethereal sort of abstract concept, but, but what does love really look like you know, in the street, in our church? And so let's think about that a little bit. In Mark's gospel, Mark tells this great story. In reality, he paints a picture of, uh, of Jesus in the midst of a, of a very hectic schedule. And uh, just in the very first chapter, um, he, he's talking about the fact that, that Jesus, on, on one of the Sabbath days, after he, shortly after he began his ministry, uh, Jesus uh, decided to make a little trip and to show up at church. Uh, if you're not familiar with Judaism, uh, the Sabbath in Judaism starts at sunset on Friday, right? And technically, according to the, the oldest sources I could find, it ends when three stars are visible in the evening sky, okay, on Saturday. Uh, that, that, that's the Sabbath. And, and so uh, sometime during that Saturday, Jesus and his disciples decided to to leave the edge of the Sea of Galilee where they'd been and, and uh, walk to a city named Capernaum. And uh, it's about a four mile walk, so that day at least they got their steps in, um, uh, if we're worried about that. And uh, when they got to Capernaum, what they decided to do was they decided to go to church, so they went to the service at the synagogue. This was not one of those kind of uh, kick back, just enjoy the service kind of times, uh, because Jesus was the teacher at this service. And so there's Jesus, you know, he's just done this uh, four mile walk, probably in a day just like today is hot, you know, dusty. And so he comes in, you can't just sit and relax, he's got to start teaching. So he starts to teach. And, and of course, wouldn't you know it, as he begins to teach, all of a sudden there's a, a man with an unclean spirit. Uh, the, and the spirit decides to manifest itself in the middle of the service. And so, in the, in the, I mean, how crazy is that, right? Uh, so now we got chaos in the midst of this service, and Jesus has to, you know, deal with the situation. He ministers to the person and uh, delivers them. And, and then I'm guessing he probably went back to his message and said, now, where was I? Uh, you know, okay, 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 here's what I'm thinking. And so he, he, he did that. So, so they, they went through all that experience, and typically those services ended very shortly before the Sabbath would end. So the three stars are out in the evening sky. And uh, so when they left church that night, uh, Jesus and his disciples went to Simon's house. And uh, when they got there, they discovered that, uh, wouldn't you know it, that, that uh, Simon's mother-in-law was sick. She had a fever. 
And so this wasn't just, uh, you know, sit in the recliner for Jesus. This was now, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to minister to this woman. And so he did exactly that. He went, he ministered to her, and, uh, and he, you know, he healed her. And, t- and it says in the scriptures that she got up and she then served her guests, as, as any woman of the time would certainly do. And so, uh, again, I don't know how long dinner lasted for them, probably not very long. The enjoyment of it was not very long because, uh, because what it tells us is that, that uh, as soon as the sun went down, suddenly there were knocks on the door of Simon's house, and they opened the door, and there's just a throng of people outside. I mean, here's, here's how Mark says it. He says, and the whole city had gathered at the door. Now, Scholars will tell you it probably wasn't the whole city. Archaeologists say that Capernaum had about 1,500 people in it at this point in Bible times. Still a lot of people. But, but the point of it was not everybody probably showed up, but a lot of people came up. So many people, uh, you know, that Mark, when he records it, you know, says, and the whole city gathered at the door. We understand that, right? You're excited about something. You're describing some event to somebody. And you say to them, oh, yeah, it was so exciting. Everybody was there. Well, everybody wasn't there. But a lot of people were there. And I don't know how these people came, if they just all came in one big crowd. My guess is there were probably times as it got into the night because Jesus was just ministering. They were bringing their sick and those who needed a touch of Jesus to Jesus. And you think, why did they wait? That's easy, because the Pharisees had taught them well and told them that it was wrong to work on the Sabbath. You couldn't carry a sick person from one place to another without exercising work. And so they had to wait till the three stars were in the sky in the evening, and, and then they could start bringing the people. And so, so Jesus was there. He's just ministering to one person after another, not just a couple, a lot. Seemed like the whole city, a lot. I don't know how it went. I think as the night went on, maybe the crowd got thinner. You know, I, I'm at, can you imagine some time when they close the door and the very next thing that happens is another person? I mean, there was no rest for Jesus here. I, I'm, I'm assuming, but I don't think it's unreasonable to believe that he probably was healing people into the wee hours of the morning. Any who came were touched. So he probably flopped down on the nearest cot got a couple of hours of sleep, and then Mark goes on to tell us, and he was up before the first light of day to go pray. So now he's out there in the wilderness somewhere praying, asking God, I'm sure his father, oh, give me the strength to do this. This is hard. He's praying for his disciples that he just newly challenged to follow him. He's praying for other people that he knew and and that he loved. Didn't get much sleep, I'm I'm guessing. In the morning, when the disciples finally got up, they were concerned because they couldn't find him. And so they they rushed around looking for him, and and they eventually found him. And it says this in, in Mark's Gospel. It says, Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him, and they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby. Why? so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. The amazing part of the early years of Jesus' ministry is that he was always on the go. He was always moving. There were always people who had needs, always people who were pressing in, wanting a little bit of him. So some of them were blind and some were lame and some were overwhelmed by demons, but you know what you'd see? Jesus was willing to use the resource of his time to love. That is the look of love. It looks like someone who's willing to give up what maybe even many of us is the most precious of our resources, and that's time. Willing to give up time to meet the needs of another. I mean, don't you love the fact that there's no place in the scriptures where you you read that that Jesus decided to take a Mediterranean vacation? A cruise. There's no time in the life of Jesus that you ever see him saying to the disciples, Hey, can you go over there to uh, Jerusalem and can you get us a nice suite in the Marriott? You just need a little time. 
I bet he felt like that. But you never read that. Instead, what you read is that at every corner, even when it was convenient or not convenient, Jesus was looking to minister to people, willing to give up his time so that he could actually touch another life. That's the look of love. I like another glimpse of this in the, in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus was outside of Decapolis. And maybe you remember the story. It says a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all. Wow, <laughs> nothing changes much sometimes. But rather had actually grown worse. And after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and she touched his cloak for she thought, if I just touch his garments, I'll get well. And immediately, it says, the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. It says, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and he said, who touched my garments? And his disciples thought he was crazy. And they said, what do you mean? Look at all of these people, right? He said, you see the crowds pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this, but the woman fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And, and he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And the reason I love this story is because here Jesus is in the midst of another busy ministry moment. I mean, another crowd is pressing in upon him. And the beauty of Jesus, the absolute love of Jesus, was that there was always time for one. I mean, the disciples were probably saying, who cares who touched you? Everybody's touching you. Let's just go. That's what I just said. <laughs> but Jesus, in his use of resources like time, was willing to love. And so he paused for this one woman. He spoke to her. He, he, he told her that it was really her faith that had made her well, and he, and he blessed her on her way. It's a, it's a wonderful scene. Jesus was willing, you see, to use his time, even when everything around him was chaotic, to stop, use the moment to love somebody else. I suppose, just to make sure we get the message, you remember, don't you, that Jesus did the same thing with little children, right? Remember when the, when the disciples were all annoyed because all these little kids were running around and they were trying to figure out how to get rid of them so that Jesus could do whatever he needed to do? And, and, and I love what Jesus said. He said, let the little children alone. Don't hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. He's willing to take a moment for even the youngest. That's love. Love is using the resource of our time to stop and pause and to, and to love somebody else, to help meet their need, to sacrifice a resource that we have, like time, in order to spend that time in loving them. And so Jesus took the time for the one, for the woman, for the little children, for the sick, for those who were demonized. He, he took time for all of them. He loved them. He spent his time for them. And so obviously it leads us to the question, well, what about us? How are we at that? I'm not always that good. A lot going on. But it's about those times. It's about those moments when we know that the Father wants us to do something, to, to you know, come out on Saturday and out early so we can walk through the streets and pray for people. It's a sacrifice of time. It's love. Now, are we willing to sacrifice that for for others, to, to spend something that we otherwise would have spent on ourselves, that's what sacrifice is, for them? It's a great question. Love obviously would call us to do that, to use the resource of time that way. But time is not the only resource that we see the scriptures talk about. Uh, we, we also see that uh, we're pretty much called to, to use our money in exactly the same way. We're to use the resource of our money to help meet the needs of other people. Uh, maybe you remember life in the early church. I love this passage in Acts chapter 4. It says, in the congregation of those, think about this, this is church. Think, it says, and the congregation of those who believed 
were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not, catch this, for there was not a needy person among them. Not one. It says, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. This, too, is the look of love. Different resource, same dynamic. A willingness to sacrifice. A a willing to take something, some resource, in this case money, that God had given them in order to help meet the needs of those who were part of their family of faith. In particular. And so our personal generosity becomes this telltale sign of our love. That's crazy. That's, that's hard. So if there is someone in our midst, for instance, that has a need, then wouldn't we have to ask ourselves the question, are we loving enough? Now I understand that we live in one of the places in the planet that has the highest cost of living. No question about it. But I also know a uh, you know, uh, another fact that goes along with that, and that is that there's probably every single person who's in this room this evening is among the most wealthy people on the planet. Huh. Interesting. I mean, think, think just for a second about the Good Samaritan. You know the story. Uh, that Good Samaritan opened his wallet so that this man who'd been beaten up by robbers could be cared for. You remember? took him to the inn, said, here, take care of him, gave some money, and said, hey, I'll come back and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll settle things with you at the end of that. Here's how Luke said it. He said, on the next day, he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. You understand from hearing many sermons, I'm sure, on this, this, uh, this particular subject that, that this is not what Samaritans did for Jews. This wasn't because this was a brother. This was an enemy. This wasn't because they had some kind of warm familial relationship with one another, not at all. They hated each other. They despised each other. But instead of showing that kind of hatred, what this Samaritan does, and what did Jesus say? Which one was the neighbor? (laughs) The Samaritan, of course. And so... That's what love looks like. Love love looks like taking money. You realize that none of the money that any of us have belongs to us. It was given to you. It was given to me by God. And and it's all he said is here. I want to give this to you and I want you to be a steward of it. I want want you to use it properly. The way that I, the master who owns all of this, would approve of. And, and so, but, but, but what love looks like is taking these resources and finding those people who have need and then, then giving them that. You, you have to love the way the early church did it. You know, here these people were, they were just moved on by God and they were bringing, they were bringing their gifts, their financial gifts to the church and they would, they would lay them at the feet of the, of the leadership of the church, like the elders. And, and it, this is just good administration. Uh, because the elders then could ferret out, ferret out the real needs from the you know, people who weren't, weren't really in need and just trying to panhandle off the church or something. And so they would bring their money, the, the elders would, would take it and hold it, and then they would distribute it. But it says, don't you think this is amazing? That not one of them had need. Not one. That's incredible. So time is one of those resources we use to love. Money is another resource with which we use to love. There's one final resource. And this one is one that we're going to talk about more as this quarter goes on. Uh, but but it's, the, it's the, the resource of our spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Every one of us that, that has put our faith in Christ and who's walking with him has been given one or more spiritual gifts. Not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the body. 
for the benefit of one another. We, we all have, I think, a basic understanding of that. It, it's, it's really these spiritual gifts are resources that God has given us to help meet the needs of others. It's a way that we love others. And so to use those spiritual gifts in the ways of love is really another way that, that love looks. Now, it might seem a little strange, I think. I don't think we always think of love and gifts being connected together. But let, let me just show you why I'm, I'm saying that, that's, that there is a connection between your spiritual gifts and your use of spiritual gifts and love that you can't tear apart. They definitely are connected together. How do I know? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul begins this little section where he talks about spiritual gifts, right? So in chapter 12, he says this. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts. So this is the topic. There's this topic sentence. He's great at English uh, or whatever he spoke. And, uh, and so he, he, we understand completely what he's talking about. And if you go into 1 Corinthians 12, you will find that, uh, that, he's, that he's laying out gifts and, and all of that. If you jump ahead then to chapter 14, if you've read that chapter in recent days or this last year maybe in your Bible reading program, you know that he's also talking about spiritual gifts in chapter 14. In chapter 14, that's where he's talking about tongues. That's where he's talking about prophecy. He's talking about how those gifts should be used in a way of love, to be frank, uh, in the church. Because you see, gifts can be misused as well as used properly. And so you look at this past, this section of scripture, you say, okay, 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking about spiritual gifts. And so now, what about 1 Corinthians 13? Most of us know 1 Corinthians 13 because he's talking about love. But if you were to actually read 1 Corinthians 13 again, um, you've, you'd find out that Paul did not write this chapter so that we'd have something nice to say at weddings. <laughs> He's really writing this to help us understand how love and the gifts cannot be torn apart. Because look what he says. This is 13, 1 to 3. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, you know, there's the gift, right? The gift of tongues. But I don't have love, then I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, there's another gift. See it? And know all the mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, there's the gift of giving. See it? And if I surrender my body to be burned but don't have love, it profits me nothing. I mean, Paul here in 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about tongues, about prophecy, about the gift of giving. And he's saying that these gifts, like all the other gifts, have to be connected with love. To properly use your gift is to use your gift in the way God designed it. And as a steward of the things that God has given us, it's, it's in the benefit of someone else. It's by love that we use these gifts. So to misuse the gifts is unloving. And, check it, to not use the gift is not loving. There's no way around that. It's just like having time and never using it for somebody who has a need. It's just like having money and never giving anything to those who have need. Same thing here. The same exact argument goes is that here are these gifts. And if we don't use the gifts in the proper way and we, and we just sit on them, that's an unloving thing to do. But when we engage our spiritual gifts, when we use them, when, when, we, when we begin to apply them to those who are our brothers and sisters in the body of faith, then that's loving. That's love because we're helping to meet the needs of those people. You see how it works. So I suppose it leaves us with questions then on this subject. I mean, do we know our gifts? Do you know your spiritual gift? Are you, uh, you know, are you using your gift? Are you using your gift as an act of love for other people? Whatever your gift may be, we'll talk more about it as this quarter kind of unfolds. But we've all been given enormous resources We've been given time. We've been given money. We've been given spiritual gifts. And what God says is, I want you to use all of those things as instruments and ways of love. Which means sacrificing those, giving those to help meet the needs of someone else. 
It's, it's not that complicated, right? It's harder to do. And when that happens, you see, what, ha what eventually takes place is these displays of love that begin to happen uh, really become ways for those outside to look at us and say things like, wow, something different about those people. Wow, their faith must be real because they're making sacrifices of their time and their money and, and their talents and abilities and gifts that God has given them to love one another. I don't know you, but that, that's the kind of reputation I would like for our church to have. Because I'll tell you what happens. When, when a church begins to live like that, the world takes notice. And I'll tell you what, there's a bunch of people that were living in those neighborhoods that were walked just this afternoon who need that kind of love. And if they saw the real thing just once, they'd say, I want that. We'd see people coming to Christ like crazy. But it falls to us. Are we those people? Are we going to be those people or not? This, this quarter is a quarter where we're developing community. Remember our four-point outline. And, uh, and if you're with us last week, you know that at the, the end of the service, I asked Steve to come up and he grabbed the microphone. And, and uh, it, was a, it was a great time of sharing stories uh, amongst ourselves. I want to do exactly the same thing tonight. I wonder if you have a story of some time in your life when, when somebody met a need of yours. When, when you were right at the very end, it doesn't have to even be that, but just somebody who demonstrated love to you by the use of time, their spiritual gift, by finances that they gave to you, 